Good afternoon, friends. Let me take you a decade back. The financial crisis in the Western world had just erupted. And one of the leading business schools realized that among the CEOs that had been indicted for wrongdoing, several of them belonged to that particular business school. So the faculty members of that business school got together and explored ways in which this scenario could be changed so that it doesn't occur in the future. And the solution they came out with was that the ethics course that was taught at that particular business school should be increased from two credits to three credits. Would that work? Let's wait for the rest of my talk to explore that answer. Now let's go back to 13th of September 1970. Milton Friedman wrote his first article, well known, he had written several articles by then, he wrote his article called The Business of Business in the New York Times. His primary premise was that the core objective of an organization or the core responsibility, the only responsibility of corporations is making profits. That's it. Shareholder primacy was the discourse that guided corporations across the world, especially in the developed economies, and inspired by that model, even in the developing world, for the subsequent three decades. Let me take you 27 years into that time period. The Business Roundtable, which is an association of very eminent American CEOs, 200 of them, who get together regularly to explore trends and developments in the field of business, and take common decisions for their fraternity. They brought out a statement on the core purpose of a corporation. And I'd like to read that out. The paramount duty of the management and the board of directors is to the corporation's stakeholders. The interests of other stakeholders are relevant as a derivative of the duty to stockholders. Which means, again, that the corporation's only objective is to ensure shareholder wealth. Just last month, this group again came together and they brought out a new core purpose of the organization. They threw the old one in the dustbin, figuratively, and the new core purpose of the organization was a 300-word statement in which the word shareholder did not appear till the 250th word. What caused the change in the total objective of the, the overview, the, the outlook of corporations towards the way they look at business. Was it the 2008 financial crisis? Probably, because ever since we see that there has been an attempt to redefine capitalism. In the year 2008, Bill Gates, while addressing his last uh, session as the head of Microsoft at DevOps, gave the term creative capitalism. In 2011, Professor Michael Porter from the Harvard Business School introduced the concept of shared value creation. And in 2013, John Mackey, the head of Whole Foods, and a Professor Raj Sisodia wrote a book called Conscious Capitalism. We see a conscious effort in adding adjectives to the word capitalism. But was conscious capitalism an oxymoron? Capitalism being conscious that was a kind of discourse and debate that was going around at that time when these were first introduced. Also, whether corporations can truly share value. But it did not end with conscious capitalism. In subsequent years, many new terms came in. Compassionate capitalism, inclusive capitalism, sustainable capitalism. It was as if capitalism needed direly an adjective which would justify its existence because in its individual capacity it was not doing something right. Was that the reason? We saw a distinct trend at least in the academic circles where the antagonistic paradigm of business versus society was moving towards a synergistic paradigm of business and society and the conversation and discourse was heading towards an enlightened paradigm of business for society. What is the reason for that? The reason is because of the magnitude of the role that corporations occupy in the, on the world stage today. Of the hundred large economies of the world today, 
51 are corporations and 49 are countries. I repeat, of the 100 large economies in the world today, 51 are corporations and 49 are companies. But it's not an ordinary era. It's an era also of plutocracy. Because the top 1% of the American economy own 90% of the wealth. India is a tad better because the top 10% of the Indian people hold 80% of the wealth. The bottom 60% own 4% of the wealth. That's the kind of inequities the capitalist system has brought into the society. But there is hope and hope is here in this room. The millennials, the Gen Y, we spoke a lot about them earlier today. Gen Y, to which even I belong to, have brought in a much needed change and a fresh perspective where they say that we want to have social impact as a core aspect of a corporation's objective. We want to have profits with purpose and we want to work in corporations where money is made for a mission. There are several researches which show that a large proportion of millennials would prefer to work in such corporations. In my research over the last 15 years, I've interviewed over 200 senior industry leaders, subject experts, scholars across three continents. And I have come to know about several worldviews about what capitalism is and truly meant to be. Professor Edward Freeman from the Darden School of Business in the University of Virginia gave me a very fascinating insight on capitalism. And he said that capitalism is the greatest system of social cooperation ever invented. It's about how we cooperate to produce that which no single one of us can produce independently. But the problem lies in the fact that capitalism or corporations are connected to business. To say that companies exist to make profits is like saying that the human body exists to make red blood cells. We do not exist to make red blood cells. We exist because our body makes red blood cells. Similarly, corporations exist because they make profits, which is definitely mandatory, but they need to exist for a much larger purpose. And that is to ensure the well-being of a very large set of stakeholders. The diagram here that I've shown indicates the very wide variety of stakeholders that any typical corporation needs to address, needs to focus on. My research over the last 15 years primarily was directed in this area as to how corporations need to create value for a larger set of stakeholders. By and large, business schools today take examples and case studies of companies from the developed economies. But you'd be surprised to know that the business schools in developed economies are studying how Indian corporations function. For example, Professor C.K. Prahlad's celebrated work on fortune at the bottom of the pyramid covered several success stories of companies which had done extremely well in the Indian scenario. And for your information, the leading business schools have almost 100 case studies on just one particular group which belongs to India and which happens to be the subject of my latest book, The Tata Group. So let me share with you what happened in 2019. The business roundtable said that while each one of our individual companies serves its own corporate purpose, we share a fundamental commitment to all our stakeholders. That's the new purpose of the corporation they spoke about. And let me tell you how this is not new to us. And because the Tata Group is a protagonist of my latest book, of course, it's not a commissioned work as several people ask me. It's an outcome of 10 years of my research and interviewing over 100 senior leaders of the Tata Group, right from Mr. Ratan Tata, to shop floor leaders in Jamshedpur and Pune factories and the central archives, I have come to certain learnings about how this group has functioned over the last 150 years. What were its highs and lows? And how is it that startups, budding entrepreneurs, managers and leaders can learn from India's largest and most globalized conglomerate? Tata brand is worth $19.5 billion and they are India's largest private sector employer. They contribute 4% to India's GDP and 2.2% of the total taxes collected. That's the magnitude of the impact that this single group makes 
to each one of us, to the economy. So what are the things that they have done which resonates with the round table opinion uh, of 2019, the new purpose of the corporation? And I'm going to share with you four stories of how the Tata Group has done this much ahead of its time. The first thing they said of the five new purposes that the corporation needs to focus on, delivering value to our customers. So let me go back to the 1970s. The Tata Motors trucks were used to have rugged, non-synchronous gearboxes. That was the time when synchronous gearboxes were not made in India. And the then chairman of Tata Motors, Suman Mulgaukar, suggested that the committee at the top discuss and explore whether they should introduce synchronous gearboxes. The committee discussed, came back, and suggested that we should not go for it because these are not available in India. These will have to be imported. The customers may not want to pay for it. And the company will end up paying for a feature which the customers don't want. So it's not advisable. Mr. Sumit Mulgaukar asked a simple question. How many of you have driven a truck for three days? Nobody had. How many of you have driven a truck for one whole day? None of them had. You do not want to give an additional feature of a synchronous gearbox to drivers who are our core customers who drive trucks 350 days a year, 24 by 7 across the rugged roads of India. Is it not fair that the company does that in order to delight that set of customers? That was not a time when Tata Motors was facing competition. In fact, it was a market leader with almost 70% market share in the commercial vehicles business. But their objective was to ensure customer delight at all costs. In fact, around that time when there was a shortage of Tata Motors trucks and there was 40,000 premium in the market, Tata Motors declined from increasing the value of the trucks, the price of the trucks. They said, you do not make profits by rising the prices in an adverse situation. You make profits by improving your productivity and efficiency. Customer affection is our greatest asset. So we are talking about concepts which are resonating in the business schools today, being practiced in India almost three decades ago. Investing in our employees was the next thing BRT, the business roundtable said. Let me take you to Tata Steel in the 1990s. Tata Steel has had a history of employee best practices, labor best practices at a time when even the developed countries did not have. Work uh, accident compensation, maternity benefits, eight hour work day. These were things which were introduced in the Tata Steel factories in the 1910s and 20s when even America and Europe did not have some of these best practices. But let's fast forward to the 1990s when Tata Steel had over 80,000 labor force. It had become the most expensive steel manufacturer in the world and it was facing real tough times. That was when they decided that they'll have to do something about it. And the first thing they would have to do was to reduce the workforce by at least half. How did they do that? They brought in an employee separation scheme where every employee who was separated would receive 1.2 to 1.5 times the existing salary. They would receive lifetime uh, insurance and medical care and they would also be permitted to use their existing accommodation for three years till they found an alternative one and if they found another job for themselves they were welcome to earn from two sources of income many of the industry peers said that uh, dr jamshed dirani told dr jamshed dirani who was the md at that time the tatas either have a lot of money or they have two little brains because nobody gives employee separation schemes of this kind 15 years later, 40,000 employees had separated joyfully without any, uh, without any kinds of strife with the company. In fact, they used to celebrate on the last day. And in 2013, when Forbes came out with a publication on the best industrial decisions of all times, there was only one company which was there from India, and that was Tata Steel, because it had done, which was impossible in any part of the world, reducing your workforce by half without any strife whatsoever. That too in an area like Jharkhand, which is Naxalite prone, and where almost 6,000 people had lost their lives in the previous three decades 
due to some kind of strife or the other. Needless to say, Tata Steel went on to become India's first Fortune 500 company, acquired global brands and achieved phenomenal success. Dealing fairly and ethically with our suppliers, here I'd like to talk about Titan. Tanish, the jewelry brand of Titan, made it big in early 2000s. They realized that their employees are doing very well, but their suppliers are retiring or rather are not able to work beyond their 40s. That is because the karigars or the babus who work on the jewelry develop neuro problems because of the poor ergonomics in which they have to work. And as a result, post 40, they are expected to or rather they are forced to be working as watchmen in metro cities. So Titan decided to start what was called a Mr. Perfect program where they established karigar parks. These karigars who were their suppliers were given state of the art kind of uh, places to work air conditioned ergonomics, insurance, uniform, medical support, all of these facilities that their peers in IT and ITES companies had. That brought in a tremendous amount of confidence in them. That also brought in a tremendous amount of benefit to Titan because their productivity levels increased. What they were manufacturing, 750 grams of jewelry per month, went up to 4 kgs of jewelry per month and their annual uh, loss due to wastage was saved by almost 30 kgs. So anything that is done keeping a stakeholder in mind brings direct benefits to the company. The fourth is supporting the communities in which we work. Why am I showing this photograph with uh, women from the Taj group of hotels? Around the year 2000s, one of the senior leaders, leaders in the Taj hotels saw a newspaper report where weavers in Banaras one of them had lost their life while selling blood in order to survive. So the first reaction they had was that we need to do something because Taj has two properties in Banaras. But they didn't want to do charity. They wanted to engage with the community so that the community has a sustainable support system. So they decided that they would provide opportunities for the Banarasi sari weavers to make saris which would be worn by the front desk staff of Tata uh, of the Taj hotels and palaces across the country and the world uh, by about 550 of them. Not only that, they adopted a village called Sarai Mohana, which was five kilometers away from Banaras with a population of 5,000, gave them all the facilities, the looms, which they had broken and sold as firewood because they were not getting opportunities for their handicrafts. They had also provided them solar lanterns to, be, uh, to work despite the power cuts and they also gave them a lot of uh, support in terms of design so that their saris and products are popular in the more contemporary markets. Sarai Mohana over the next 10 years became a part of the tourist circuit and New York Times wrote a report about the success story of Sarai Mohana in 2015. In a decade, that particular village and its community had moved from destitution to total change. My last point is about generating long-term value for shareholders. This is what the BRT said was the large objective. In my research, both on the Tata Group and the previous book, Win Win Corporations, I have studied the performance of the Tata companies for almost 25 years and a lakh rupee invested in 16 leading Tata companies over 25 years gave returns which was four times the returns of the Bombay Stock Exchange and the Tata companies over the 25 years gave more returns to their shareholders than leading conglomerates in Europe, Asia and America like Siemens, Mitsubishi and GE and they even gave more returns than Berkshire Hathaway under the phenomenal Warren Buffett. The same was seen in win-win corporations where leading companies like HUL, Larson & Tubro, TVS, Bharat Petroleum and several others that I have studied in that book have given far more returns than the market. I'll conclude by saying my theme was building win-win businesses. What is building win-win businesses? Does it mean that you add social impact and sustainable development as an additional key area in the larger corporate strategy? No. Building win-win businesses means that while designing every corporate strategy, the corporate looks at creating value for itself and for its larger set of stakeholders. That is the core. And as Samir mentioned earlier today, the message of the Bhagavad Gita, 
Building win-win businesses means that the means are as important as the ends. Something that Mahatma Gandhi, whose 150th birth anniversary we celebrated earlier this week, had encouraged industrialists in India to do all the while during the freedom struggle. Ultimately, human beings have to be at the core of the organization. Because of the six M's of management, money, machines, minutes, methods, and materials, it is the six M, men or human beings, that give value to the other five. And it is that M of human beings that needs to be center stage in corporations if we want to build inclusive, responsible, sustainable, and win-win businesses for the future. Let's do it. Thank you.